Throughout the Middle Ages, castles dominated the landscape of Britain. They were at once mighty strongholds and splendid residences, enduring symbols of aristocratic power. But by the 1600s, the age of castles was over. Long centuries of peace had made them redundant. Many of them had fallen into ruin. Their splendor was decayed. Their power was forgotten. Then, suddenly, in the spring of 1642, this peace was shattered by the bloodiest war ever fought on British soil. And at the sound of war, the castle awoke. The Civil War of the 17th century brought castles back to life. From Corth to Conway, from Pembroke to Pendennis, these ancient buildings were dragged back into military service. Tens of thousands of people would die trying to capture or defend them. In this conflict, castles were up against the most destructive technology of the age, the cannon and the mortar. These weapons would come in record numbers to Raglan in South Wales, one of the grandest castles in Britain. Raglan was typical of the castles that were still in use during the 17th century. Inside its medieval walls, Raglan had been refashioned into a sumptuous stately home. But the old man who owned it would soon have reason to be grateful for the thick walls built by his ancestors. He was Henry Somerset, first Marquess of Worcester. He was very much a man of the old order. A rich and well-connected aristocrat, he was also, it seems, a jolly good egg. We've got a pretty good idea what the Marquess of Worcester was like, thanks to his chaplain, Dr Thomas Bailey, who, years after his master's death, wrote a memoir. And from Bailey's reminiscences, the Marquess appears to be a genial, good-natured old buffer, and above all, a loyal servant to the Crown. In fact, he'd served for over 40 years to three successive monarchs, Elizabeth I, James I, and Charles I. So by the 1640s, the Marquis must have felt that his political service was complete. He'd had a long life, and all he wanted was to play out his remaining years here at Raglan Castle, safe in the knowledge that it would pass to his heirs. Now, the Marquis couldn't know it, but civil war was going to shatter his peaceful retirement, and his castle, his home, was going to be on the front line. Raglan had been established 200 years earlier by the Marquis's ancestors, a father and son team, both called William. They'd fought in France during the Hundred Years' War, and this had not only earned them a fortune, it had also given them a few ideas about castle building. What we've got here at Raglan Castle is a castle built in the 15th century in the very latest French style. You've got big hexagonal towers, and those towers are topped with matriculations, decorative thing around the top. You've even got gargoyles on there, it's so decorative. So these guys, coming back from the Hundred Years' War, Dad, who builds that great tower over there, and Junior, who builds the gatehouse and the rest of the castle, are really showing off. They're really flashing the cash around. But they're not just showing off. Look how thick, for example, the walls are on the tower. That's got to be 10 to 11 feet thick over there. The moat around the tower, impressive and deep. The gatehouse has gun ports in it, and the gatehouse itself is a really strong defence. You're going to have big oak doors and portcullises there. This is a proper castle. This is a proper stronghold. But the thing is, anyone coming along here when all this lot's going up is going to say, I see a building on a big scale, particularly like the gargoyles. But why are you building a castle? Even in the middle of the 15th century, castles were a thing of the past. Decades of peace had convinced the aristocracy to forsake the defences devised by their ancestors. Now, the super-rich were lavishing their money on courtyard houses. In the 16th century, spectacular country seats set amid ornamental gardens and ponds were constructed right across the country. Castles, meanwhile, 
were everywhere falling into ruin. If a castle remained occupied, it was probably for sentimental reasons, because Dad or Grandad had built it. So if you inherited a crumbling castle, what on earth could you do? Well, home improvements is the answer. If you look over here at Raglan, there's this big new kitchen block, and you can tell it's new because you can see up there there's an arrow loop, which was originally outside on the medieval castle, but this wall has been pushed back in the 16th century to accommodate these lovely new service rooms here. You're going to have pantries, butteries, rooms stocked with meat, stocked with wine, stocked with fish, all the things you need to lead the good life in the 16th century. But what you really need to lead the good life is more light. You want to make your dank and dingy castle as brilliant as one of those courtyard houses. And to do that, you need Tudor windows. In an age of peace, the small, pokey windows of previous centuries could be ripped out and replaced with big, beautiful new ones. This process, however, was hugely expensive, even for rich aristocrats. But the replacement window business in England was about to be revolutionised by Frenchmen. There was a sort of influx of glassmakers from France who specialised in this cylinder glass technique and they could make sort of bigger, better cylinders than had been seen before. And that, that of course is exactly the period that we're getting these enormous new windows at Raglan Castle. That's right, yes. So what's Harry doing now? He's put a little sort of um, nipple or tit on the end of the glass and right at the end um, he'll knock that teat off which will leave a little aperture and once you've got the hole at the end then you can insert the tools to open up the cylinder. Okay. It all sounds rather rude. Now a hollow this cylinder doesn't sound to me terribly useful if I'm a Tudor courtier who wants flat, flat windows, well, not that, cylindrical ones. I mean all, all flat glass in the 16th century started off being a bubble you know, you couldn't get flat glass without blowing bubbles. It's just getting He's huge now. Reheating it in the glory hole. This is the glory hole. Right. And swinging it just to elongate it. This is centuries of experimentation and refining yes. technique. He makes it look easy. Yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful looking cylinder. But me, the customer, I want windows, not, not, not tubes of glass. And when once it's cold, then it's scored to slit it along its length. It, it's reheated and opened up into a flat. Right, so from that sheet. we could get a sheet of glass, yeah, sort of... A great rectangle of glass. But we've got a totally different process here. This is called crown glass, with a bit of magic it's going to turn into something that could be used for window glass. Oh, oh wow, that is amazing. It comes out into this great broad disc. The thinnest and the finest glass is round the edge of that disc. The bit in the middle would be no use for glazing because it's thick. So we've got this beautiful large disc, but we're only going to be able to break this up and create small diamonds yes, or bits for doing... Yes, that, that's right. Astonishing, isn't it? Thanks to these new techniques in glass production, castles everywhere acquired large new windows. At Raglan, four were inserted into the hall to flood it with light. But castle owners weren't content with improving their old existing rooms, like the halls and the bedrooms, which had well-established functions. In the 16th century, Raglan Castle acquires a new room which doesn't seem to have had any particular function at all. This room was the Long Gallery, and you can see all that remains of it up there on the second floor a few shards of what was once a huge and brightly lit window. And the gallery extended all the way back to where I'm walking now. It was 40 metres long, so it was a very long gallery indeed. Now, it might look a bit tatty and ruinous now, but in the 16th century when it was built, this was the most spectacular room in Raglan Castle. Not all long galleries are in such a sorry state today. The long gallery here at Haddon Hall in Derbyshire is very similar to the one that was once at Raglan Castle. It was built in the late 16th century and at 110 feet long and 19 feet wide, its dimensions are almost identical. When you come here, you get a really strong sense of just how spectacular the long gallery at Raglan must have been. <laughs> 
This beautifully ornate plastered ceiling with its heraldic devices and floral motifs is just one of the many impressive features of the long gallery at Haddon Hall. There are plenty of others. There's a riot of windows all the way around the room and if you look at the windows you can see the panes of glass are at different angles so that when the light strikes them it's diffused all the way around the room. This might seem a lot of trouble to go to, to brighten up what seems to be a corridor between two other rooms. But in the 16th century, the long gallery was the place to be seen. The idea kind of derives from an Italian villa, where you'd have a colonnade outside where you could stroll up and down, have a glass of wine and have a good conversation. But because in England, the weather isn't quite as nice as it is in Italy, in England you need this space inside. So this is an interior space where ladies could stroll up and down, take a bit of exercise, practice their dancing. It's where gentlemen could come and practice their fencing. In fact, galleries quickly become so popular that people start hanging their pictures in them. So by the Marquis of Worcester's day, visitors arriving at Raglan knew they were in for a good time. By 1640, with its sumptuous long gallery, well-stocked wine cellars and spectacular grounds, the castle had become a pleasure palace. The Marquis of Worcester was something of an oddity because although he lived in a Protestant country, he was a Roman Catholic. But he doesn't seem to have been a religious fanatic. In fact, what really impressed his chaplain, Dr Thomas Bailey, was the Marquis's well-ordered 500-strong household. Half of them were Catholics, but the other half were Protestants, and yet they all seemed to get along just fine, because the Marquis was a wise and prudent man. If only the same could have been said for his king. Whereas the Marquis of Worcester was tolerant and wise, his king, Charles I, was dogmatic, headstrong and foolish. By 1642, his unbending stance on matters of religion and his contempt for parliamentary privilege had plunged Britain into civil war. The country was divided against itself. Those who supported Parliament made ready to face those who sided with the king. Roundheads and cavaliers met in open battle. The owners of stately homes looked on in horror. Their walls and windows were not designed for war. Aristocrats on both sides recognised the futility of trying to defend their grand residences. But war gave castles a renewed importance and both sides rushed to gain control of them. Great fortresses, long since derelict, were repaired and refortified. What followed was a spectacle not seen for centuries. Armies laying siege to castles, trying to smash down their walls or starve their defenders into submission. At Raglan Castle, the Marquis of Worcester watched these events and waited. For the first three years of the Civil War, Raglan Castle is quite safe because it's tucked in the royalist heartlands of South Wales. But then, in the summer of 1645, the royalists suffer an absolutely catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Naseby. And after that, all Parliament has to do is mop up the surviving royalist garrisons in their castles. So faced with these kind of odds, a lot of royalists simply give up. But there are others who don't, because for them it doesn't matter how desperate the situation is, it's the principle of the thing. And that's the way the Marquis of Worcester feels. He's going to stick it out until the bitter end. Three weeks after his devastating defeat at Naseby, Charles I arrived at the gates of Raglan. He brought with him thousands of hungry troops. The Marquis might not have been an arch-Catholic, but he was certainly an arch-royalist. In fact, since the Civil War had started, he'd given more money than any other person to support the King's cause, even though he thought Charles himself was a bit of a burk. And sure enough, when the King showed up after his defeat at Naseby, the Marquis bailed him out again. He gave him money to buy bread to feed his troops, and he let the king stay for a full three weeks. The only thing the Marquis hadn't done for the king was to fight in person. As a man in his late 60s, he was a bit old to be charging into battle. But now that didn't matter, because the battle was coming to the Marquis. Naseby had been a victory for Parliament's huge new model army, 
but this giant fighting force was now split into smaller contingents who set out to capture the remaining royalist strongholds. At castles across Britain, the royalists holed up and the roundheads closed in. The resistance was stiffest in the southwest, at Bristol, at Pendennis and at Raglan. So having decided to stick it out and fight, the Marquis now has to convert his lovely palatial stately home of a castle back into a military stronghold. So the first thing he does is get a garrison of royalist soldiers in here. He's got hundreds of soldiers paid for out of his own pocket, milling around where his household servants once were. And the Marquis takes no joy in this. His chaplain, Dr Bailey, records that he was particularly upset by the swearing and the drunkenness of the soldiery. But unfortunately, this is a necessary evil. Now, it's not just hundreds of extra bodies within the castle walls that the Marquis has to put up with. He also has to stand by and watch the castle get knocked around. You can see that this doorway has been widened this side and this side. This is because the Royalist garrison bring 20 cannons with them, but the Marquis has got nowhere to store gunpowder and to grind it. So this cellar has to become a powder mill, and the doorway has to be widened like this so the barrels can go in and come out. So the Marquis has made all these preparations inside the castle in readiness for war. He's now going to make defences outside the castle for when the parliamentarians arrive. And if you look just beyond that wall down there, you can see there's just the remains of one or two mounds of earth. And it's all that remains of the bastions that the Royalist garrison built, these great platforms of earth on which to mount some of the cannon. Now these kind of things were thrown up not just around castles, but all around the country in the 17th century during the Civil War. Earthwork defences were also constructed around cities, such as the Royalist base at Oxford. Their diamond-shaped bastions were deliberately thrust forward from the walls. This allowed the cannon on top not only to fire outwards in the direction of an approaching enemy, but also along the length of the defences for when the enemy got close. So the Marquis has now taken every possible precaution. He's boarded up some of the windows. He's converted one of the cellars into a gunpowder mill. He's got cannons mounted on top of the new bastion towers and on top of the castle walls. All he can do now is sit and wait for the inevitable. And sure enough, the inevitable comes. On the 3rd of June, 1646, 1,500 parliamentarian troops crest that hill, led by Colonel Morgan. On that same day, Morgan sends a letter into the Marquis. He says, basically, you're surrounded. You've got no hope of relief. You might as well surrender, or you can face the consequences. And the Marquis writes back and says, thanks very much, but I'll trust to God and fight for the honour that should attend me with death. The siege of Raglan was about to begin. The Marquis may have been trusting to God, but he was also putting great faith in the 15th century walls that surrounded him. His attackers, however, were no longer armed with the crossbows and catapults that his medieval ancestors had anticipated. The army now outside his gates had come equipped with the very latest in siege technology. There's sparks and bits of hot material left over from the shot. So we can't just stuff a load of high explosives down the end of this barrel because we'll blow ourselves up. So the starting of firing it involves cleaning it. And so we start off with this wad hook designed to pick up any material at the bottom of the barrel, just like a corkscrew trying to dig into a wine bottle. Or a very large pipe cleaner. The next thing is a mop <laughs> or a sponge. All these technical terms. Now, let me guess, a dry one. That's right, because yeah. gunpowder doesn't like water. Right. Now we're ready to put some gunpowder in the gun. If you could go to the breech end and put a glove on. Right. And then seal up the vent. Just here. 
and that stops air escaping, causing a, a, a spark which might then kill me. So you're looking after me. All right, we'll do. Now we're ready to put some gunpowder in it. During the 17th century, gunpowder quality was very variable. And one of the chief skills of a gunner was assessing his powder to give him the velocity and range he needed without blowing himself up. I've got to keep my thumb here, Stu. Yes, you've definitely got to keep your thumb there. Next, we use a bit of grass. It's there to hold the cartridge in place and to provide a seat for the cannonball. Let me hand that to you, Eric. And uh, so that just goes down the muzzle, does it? That's right. Does this mean I can take my thumb off? Just about. Hey. Right. I just fill it up like that. We're now ready to fire it. Right, OK. Um, earplugs? You can if you like, but if you just step back, you should be all right. Um, any safety tips before you fire it? Just don't stand in front of it. OK. Have a care! It's quite noisy, that. <laughs> and smelly as well. <laughs> when the barrage from the parliamentary guns began, it was relentless. Morgan's troops had dug themselves in just 400 metres from the castle walls and were pounding them with 60 shot a day. The walls, however, held out. Morgan's guns were not big enough to breach them, so the colonel had no option but to keep driving forward his trenches, tightening his grip on the castle, and hoping that the Marquis himself might crack under the pressure. But the Marquis showed no sign of doing so. He at least had a roof over his head. Outside the castle, conditions were not nearly so comfortable. A few weeks into the siege, there were 3,000 men there, and they were living at best under canvas, some of them in trenches. Now, these are men who've served in the New Model Army for maybe four years. And remember, they're under fire as well. The Royalists also have cannons, so to some extent, these are also men living in fear. And it wasn't just cannon that tested the nerves of men on both sides. As the parliamentarians drew closer, both they and the Royalists became targets for snipers. In the trenches, you kept your head down. In the castle, if you had to pass a window, you moved quickly. One place, it seems, where the Marquis's ancestors had compromised the defensibility of the castle is up there. You can see all that remains of a once huge window that looked into the Marquis's private dining room. And at one point during the siege, a musket ball came crashing through that window, bounced off one of the pillars, and struck the Marquis on the head. Now, some of the ladies present fainted, but according to Dr Bailey, the Marquis made a joke. Gentlemen, he said, in my youth, I was told that I was strong-headed, and you can see I'm still strong-headed in old age because my head is musket-proof. Joking aside, the Marquis must have realised that he'd done well even to survive a ricochet. Musket technology had recently become more sophisticated and deadly. You might survive a hit from a 20 bore, but a 12 bore would kill you without any problem whatsoever. What's 12 bore mean? That's 12 musket balls to the pound in weight. Oh, okay. So, David, what are we looking at here? This is uh, this is the later development, and it's called a... a a flintlock. Right. Now, this particular version is called a dog lock, and this small piece is called a dog. Right which engages into there. The flint strikes this and creates spark which goes into the pan where the powder is. Okay. This closes, you would then seal the prison with beeswax. Right, okay. This would make it completely waterproof so that you would at least get one shot even in the most driving severe rain, yeah, weather water. conditions. Right. Now these are very new, aren't they, in the 1640s? Yes. yes. Right. Can I have a crack at it? Take your aim. Don't forget to bend your left oh, okay, leg. So sort of That's it, the compensation of the recoil. Good shot. Oh. That was a very good shot. I <laughs> felt the recoil, though. <laughs> yes. God. And it, also sort of the explosion in front of your face. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I felt my hair was going to so catch fire. That was terrific. Right. <laughs> oh, I want to have another go now. Whoa. That man's going down. He's got a sore leg and a, a sore arm. Fantastic. Let's have another go. Raglan Castle was subjected to a hail of musket fire. The days of relaxation and royal visits must have seemed a world away. As the Marquis now gazed out of his castle, he could have hardly recognised the landscape in front of him. 
Where there had once been ornamental gardens, there was now a war zone, a no man's land where all the trees had been ripped down, any cottages in the way had been deliberately destroyed, and the air would have been thick with gun smoke and the sound of cannon. The bombardment continued relentlessly. The Royalists now realised that they had no hope of breaking out. But at the same time, the Roundheads couldn't break in. All they could do was keep inching forward with their trenches. Eight weeks in, and the siege was a stalemate. But the situation was about to be totally transformed by the arrival of two new characters on the scene. One was a dashing young war hero. The other was Roaring Meg. In 1646, the civil war was going very badly for King Charles I. All over the country, his royalist supporters were in retreat. In May, the king himself surrendered to his Scottish enemies. But at Raglan in South Wales, the fight went on. The great medieval castle there was being besieged by thousands of roundheads. But its owner, the Marquis of Worcester, was determined to hold out at any cost. From the start of August, however, the Marquis had to contend with a new and formidable adversary, Commander-in-Chief of the New Model Army and hero of the Battle of Naseby, General Sir Thomas Fairfax. On August the 7th, the General arrived at Raglan. Fairfax immediately wrote to the Marquis and demanded that he surrender. The Marquis sent a fairly flippant letter back, in which he described the castle as his house and wondered how, by law or conscience, Fairfax was going to force him out of it. Fairfax, when he got this letter, must have realised that the old man was winding him up, and he sent back a testy reply. If you hadn't transformed it into a garrison, I should not have troubled your lordship with a summons, and if you were to remove the garrison, neither you nor your house would receive any trouble from me. Despite his peaked tone, Fairfax knew that he didn't have to waste time debating with the Marquis. No sooner had the general arrived at Raglan than a new and devastating weapon was placed at his disposal. This is Roaring Meg, and back in the 17th century, Meg and her sisters were the most terrifying weapons imaginable. She's a mortar piece, and what's more, she was the biggest mortar piece of the Civil War, and she was cast in the year 1646, exactly the same year as the Siege of Raglan. Now, mortar pieces in the 17th century were quite a new thing. They'd only been around for about 50 years or so. And they differed from conventional cannon in two ways. They were intended not to smash through the walls like cannon, but to lob their missiles right over walls into the centre of the castle. And the things they fired, well, you can see, much bigger than cannonballs. This is about 13 inches across here. And unlike cannonballs, which were solid, they were, they were empty. This is a fragment of a surviving 17th century grenade. It wouldn't have been solid, about the size of a football, but it's hollow on the inside. And here, packed in the middle, you would have had musket balls, bits of shrapnel, all kinds of nasty things. But if one of these grenades landed in the middle of the courtyard and exploded, all the stuff inside would rip through limb and tissue. So the mortar was an absolutely devastating and deadly anti-personnel weapon. Mortars were famous for the fear and panic that they could produce. A defender in another siege wrote that even little ladies had stomach to digest cannon, but the stoutest soldiers had no heart for mortars, which frightened them from meat and sleep. It was weapons such as these that were now being trained on the Marquis and his family. If a grenade from a mortar came sailing over these walls and was packed with sort of 17th century musket balls here, and it was also packed with all kinds of other nasty stuff, shrapnel and bits and bobs. What kind of damage is that going to do to someone who stood in this courtyard? Quite a lot. These balls are quite heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so as they came over, if you got in the way, um, they are going to have the ability to do a lot of damage to your flesh, shatter bones, damage internal organs. And in addition to whatever rubbish is actually on the musket ball, you've got whatever rubbish is dragged in through your clothing, whatever's on your skin, 
and that's getting right down into your tissues and you've got pretty much a perfect cocktail for infection to set in. And no way of dealing with it? It's no disinfectants, no antibiotics and actually no idea of how infection occurred. I suppose if the infection spreads, the only option you've got is to use one of these... Uh tools you've brought with you here today? Pretty much. This is a bone saw. It looks like a hacksaw to me. It does. It looks very like a hacksaw. Um, this is specifically for cutting bone and to get down to the bone they would have had a tool something oh, like this. Tremendous. So that would be used for cutting flesh Yeah. and then once you're down to the bone the hard work begins. Right and all under general anaesthetic one hopes? Uh, unfortunately not. Probably the best you could hope for was a good dose of rum or brandy. Yeah. Six strong men to hold you down and somebody who is very quick at the job. Suppose they did get your gangrenous limb off, what next? Um, they'd, ha they'd have to have some way of stopping the stump bleeding um, and hot tar, pitch, anything along there, literally just dip in to mm. seal it. If you were uh, lucky or unlucky enough, depending on your viewpoint, to uh, not survive this uh, sophisticated surgery, and you, you, you drop dead, then what? Well, I think probably the only option they would have was to throw the bodies over the wall into the moat. It was going to be pretty tight packed in here anyway, as well as whatever household members, there were 800 soldiers, plus their horses, plus all the stores as well. Yeah. They were absolutely trapped, they'd got nowhere to run to, they'd got nowhere to hide, um, and just there must have been a feeling of utter helplessness. By now, the defenders at Raglan were almost completely alone. Across the country, the royalist cause lay in tatters. Only in Cornwall, at the tiny castle of Pendennis, were the King's supporters putting up a similar show of resistance. But the Marquis and his household knew nothing of this distant struggle. In a letter to the Marquis, Fairfax stretched the truth. Raglan alone obstructs the kingdom's universal peace, he said, and urged the old man to come to terms. <laughs> The general's words were now backed by the threat of overwhelming force. If the Marquis had dared to peer over his parapets, he would have seen six mortars being rolled into place, ready to fire right into the heart of his castle. So the Marquis of Worcester was caught between a rock and a hard place. If the mortars were fired, he and his family were very likely to be torn to bits. On the other hand, if he surrendered, he didn't know what a vindictive parliament might do to him. As he confessed in a letter to Fairfax, the prospect of surrender doth a little affright me. Fairfax, sensing the old man's desperate dilemma, hammered the point home. If you stay in the castle, he said, you and your family, whom I presume are dear to you, are likely to die. At the same time, he gave him his word as a gentleman that if he surrendered, he would receive fair treatment. What I promise, said Fairfax, will be made good. The Marquis asked to hear what terms Fairfax was willing to offer. The deal, as it turned out, was a very good one. The Royalist garrison would be allowed to march out of the castle and disband. But the terms would not apply to the Marquis himself. When his troops heard the offer, they pledged to fight on, but their master's mind was clearly already made up. Like Jonah, he said, he would rather be cast overboard and see them all perish. So the Marquis, having been besieged in his own home for two whole months, finally decided to surrender. On the 19th of August, 1646, the Royalists finally abandoned Raglan Castle. The parliamentary mortars were never fired. Poor old Colonel Morgan the man who'd started the siege, the man who'd been in charge of Parliament's army until Fairfax showed up, doesn't even get to fire a mortar. He's been living in a trench or under canvas for over two months and he doesn't get to heroically storm the breach. You can hear the disappointment in his voice when he wrote to Parliament the day the treaty was concluded. Had not this happy conclusion been made, he grumbled, we would have got to fire the mortars and our trenches were come very close. With the siege and the war over, the Marquis of Worcester was transported to London. 
now he was at the mercy of a victorious parliament and would soon discover the value of Fairfax's promises. In Westminster, both houses were already debating what to do with defeated royalists and their castles. There is a dilemma in Parliament. These are potentially valuable fortifications and installations for Parliament themselves, possibly to refortify and garrison. On the other hand, um, if there were future trouble, um, then of course they could fall into the hands of opponents. So what kind of evidence do we have for these debates that are taking place? A lot of documentation has not survived, but we do have this fantastic series of journals which records the decisions of Parliament at that time. And we have here the date reference, Tuesday, 25th of August, 1646. So this is just six days after Raglan falls. That's right. And here in the margin, we have the actual subject matter, Raglan Castle to be demolished. Yeah. And the text reads, Resolved that the castle of Raglan, the works about with the houses and buildings thereof to be pulled down and demolished. Oh, right. And then finally, down here, all the materials should be sold and disposed of for the best advantage of the state. And then the conclusion of the episode, that the person of the Earl of Worcester be forthwith sent for, and that upon his arriving in London, to be forthwith committed prisoner to the Tower. The Marquis had been duped. Fairfax's promises of a fair hearing had counted for nothing. The old man clearly believed that he had fought an honourable fight in defence of his faith and his king. In his captivity, he reflected bitterly on his shabby treatment. But while the Marquis himself remained a prisoner, his castle continued to resist. When demolition work began at Raglan Castle, it was men armed with only pickaxes and sledgehammers. And you can see they had a good bash. They managed to get the top story of the great tower off. But this is masonry 10 feet thick. No matter how hard you hack away at it, you're not going to do much damage. So even in defeat, Raglan Castle is proving a really tough nut to crack. Demolishing a castle was easier said than done. It could be speeded up by using explosives, as Parliament had proved at Corfe in Dorset. When this castle surrendered, large quantities of gunpowder were used to bring it down. This, however, was extremely costly. Not only was the gunpowder itself expensive, the ragged lumps of stone it created couldn't be sold for profit. Not everyone was convinced that such wanton destruction was the best way forward. Now that the war was over, there was a general reluctance to see more things blown up. Most people thought that the emphasis should be on rebuilding rather than further destruction. So although there were a few hardliners, both in Parliament and in the army, who were saying, for goodness sake, tear the castles down now while we've got the chance, the majority of MPs just dithered. A general cull was resisted, and the castle lived to fight another day. MPs imagined that by imprisoning men like the Marquis, they had neutralised the royalist threat. But they had not counted on the enemy within. Deep divisions had arisen between Parliament and its new model army. As they squabbled for power, the royalists saw their chance. They took up arms once more and seized castles in the name of the king. What was Parliament going to do? Well, one thing was for certain, they weren't going to make the same mistake twice. The hardliners' policy of total destruction was now the order of the day. And there was one man who, above all, was going to make sure that that order was carried out. Oliver Cromwell. A military genius with uncompromising beliefs, Cromwell personified the hardline approach. While Fairfax dealt with the rebellions in the southeast, Cromwell headed north, where the struggle centred on Pontefract Castle in Yorkshire. Parliament had chosen not to demolish it after the First War and was now paying the price. In July 1648, Pontefract Castle was recaptured by the Royalists and there's a terrific and true story about how they did it. The first thing they tried was to go over the walls under cover of darkness using scaling ladders, but that didn't work. They were discovered and the alarm was raised. Now, the parliamentary governor inside the castle, realising that there was trouble brewing, ordered more soldiers from the town and more beds for them. Now, this is where the royalists had a brilliant idea. They disguised themselves as bed delivery men 
and carrying beds, they simply walked into the castle. Now, once they were inside, they threw down the beds, got out their weapons and imprisoned the garrison. So the Royalists had pulled off the most audacious coup. They'd managed to trick their way into the castle, and once they were inside, they'd managed to imprison their parliamentary opponents down here in the cellar. They must have been delighted, overjoyed at their own cunning and their extreme good fortune. But the Cavaliers weren't going to be laughing for very long. By the end of the summer, Pontefract was surrounded by 5,000 parliamentary troops. And in November, Cromwell himself arrived, determined to take the castle at any cost. Cromwell realised that Pontefract was going to be a really hard castle to take, and so he ordered up 500 barrels of gunpowder, 1,800 cannonballs, and as many cannon and mortar pieces as Parliament could spare. And he ranged them all the way around the castle. Now, amazingly, the Royalist garrison inside didn't give up when they saw this mighty arsenal. Even the mortar pieces couldn't persuade them to surrender. Cromwell, however, had thought of another way to end the Royalist Rebellion. He was about to play his trump card. Cromwell's solution was without precedent. In January 1649, the captive King Charles I was brought to Westminster Hall and tried as a tyrant, traitor, murderer and public enemy. For a man convicted of such crimes, there was only one possible punishment. On the 30th of January, 1649, the king was publicly beheaded. The king's death was a crushing blow for his supporters. After holding out for eight months, the royalist garrison at Pontefract now surrendered. The civil war was over. So Cromwell had killed the king, and he was now resolved to kill the castle. This time, there would be absolutely no mercy. Pontefract was one of the first castles up for the chop. And as you can see, Cromwell and Parliament did a really good job on it. One of the mightiest royal castles in England was reduced to a pile of rubble. Similar harsh punishments were meted out at other castles. But destruction on this scale was hideously expensive. Parliament was forced to consider other options. You're going to blow up this building later today. If I was to say to you, I've got a stone building like a castle, walls 12 to 20 feet thick, it stands 60 to 100 feet tall, and all you've got is picks and shovels, and you've got some explosive, what's the scale of the challenge? I know there's all kinds of variables there. Yeah, it sounds like months of work with, with picks and shovels, definitely. Yeah. Sounds a horrendous job, but I know during the war, the army undermined structures where they dug tunnels underneath the buildings, then using a vast amount of explosives underneath the structure, which can be detonated to remove really the earth underneath the foundations, so that the foundations would be stood on flesh air and gravity takes so over, the building would collapse into the hole you've made. Do you still use undermining techniques today? Yeah, but we don't use dynamite now. It's a powder explosives. It just looks like washing line. And what we do is just lay a piece of this thing and it's only got 40 gram of explosion per meter of cord. We just need enough to break the concrete. We don't blow the walls completely out. We crack the concrete, take the structural support out of it so it can't hold anything up. And the building's away. Right, Vic, you show me how to get out of here. Yeah, out this way. Undermining was Parliament's compromise solution to its castle problem. Unable to finance outright demolition, MPs contented themselves with a process they called slighting. At castles like Helmsley, Scarborough and Kenilworth, great medieval towers were partially collapsed by digging under their foundations. Left standing in places, they were now undefendable. Slighting was the solution that was finally adopted at Raglan, its former owner, the Marquis of Worcester, was now aged almost 70. Yet he remained in prison as the heart was being ripped out of his home. <laughs> 
Here at Raglan, you can see the terrible effects that slighting could have on a castle. The Great Tower was finally broken when parliamentary engineers undermined it and brought half of it crashing to the ground. But they didn't stop at simply making the castle undefendable. They went on to trash the whole building. Paintings, furniture, even fireplaces were ripped out and sold. All the castle's windows were smashed and the Marquis's library of rare books was deliberately put to the torch. What took place here was not just an act of destruction, it was an act of vengeance. And while all this destruction was taking place, the Marquis of Worcester, the genial old buffer who'd wanted to pass Raglan Castle onto his heirs, was a prisoner in the Tower of London. And it was there, on the 19th of December, 1646, that he died. His last words, I shall have a better castle when I am dead than the one they took from me when I was alive. The Civil War was the castle's last stand. The monarchy was soon restored, but castles everywhere had been written off. They were sold for scrap and plundered for stone. Over time, however, hostility turned into indifference, and indifference, eventually, gave way to affection. Castles are now recognised as buildings that have shaped Britain's history. Once again, they are treasured and not just by a handful of privileged individuals. Today, all of us can visit these great monuments and contemplate a vanished world. And if we use our imaginations, we can restore them to their former glory. <laughs>